Page 7. The Strangest Man, The Hidden Life of Paul Dirac, Mystic of the Atom, by Graham Farmello, 2009. Chapter 1. Part 1. English home life today is neither honorable, virtuous, wholesome, sweet, clean, nor in any creditable way distinctively English. It is in many respects conspicuously the reverse. A. George Bernard Shaw, Preface to Getting Married, 1908. As Kurt Hofer had seen, the elderly Paul Dirac was fixated on his father Charles. But most of Dirac's acquaintances knew nothing of this, at home, he allowed no photographs of his father to be displayed, and he kept his father's papers locked in his desk. Dirac examined them from time to time and talked with distant relatives about his father's origins, apparently still trying to understand the man he believed had blighted his life. Dirac knew that his father had endured a childhood no less miserable than his own. By the time Charles Dirac was twenty, in 1888, he had done three stints of national service in the Swiss Army, dropped out of university in Geneva and left home, without telling his family where he was heading. He became an itinerant teacher of modern languages, the subject he had studied at university, and held posts in Zurich, Munich and Paris, before he fetched up two years later in London. English was one language that he did not speak well, so it is not clear why he chose to live in Britain perhaps it was because it was the world's wealthiest economy, with plenty of teaching jobs at relatively high salaries. Six years later, Charles Dirac had acquired a sheaf of complimentary references. One, written by the headmaster of a school in Stafford, stated that Monsieur Dirac is possessed of very great patience combined with firmness. I believe he is much liked both by his colleagues and pupils. His employer in Paris had praised his capacity to analyze and generalize, which enabled him to point out my mistakes and help me to ascertain scientifically why they were mistakes. Charles settled in Bristol, a city famous for the high quality of its schools, and he became head of modern languages at the rapidly expanding Merchant Venturers School on September 8, 1896, contracted to teach 34 hours a week for an annual salary of £180. He stood out among the teachers because of his conscientiousness, his thick Swiss French accent and his appearance, a short, stocks, slow-moving man with a drooping mustache a receding hairline and a face dominated by a huge forehead. Mellowest of British industrial cities, Bristol was known for the friendliness of its people, its mild and wet climate and the hilly roads that win their way down to the moorings on the River Avon, eight miles from the coast. Bristol was then a thriving manufacturing center, producing Fry's chocolate, Wills's cigarettes, Douglas motorcycles and many other commodities. Together, these industries had eclipsed the declining trade and shipping, which had been the city's main source of wealth for centuries, some of it based on the slave trade. Most of the city's wealthiest maritime figures were members of the Merchant Venturers Society, a secretive group of industrialists with a strong philanthropic tradition. It was the generosity of the society that had made possible the founding of Charles's school together with the high standard of its workshop and laboratory facilities. During a visit to the Central Library a few months after his arrival in Bristol, Charles met Florence Holton, the guileless 19-year-old librarian who would become his wife. Though no beauty, she was attractive and possessed features that she would later pass on to her most famous child. Her oval face was framed by dark, curly hair, and a firm nose darted out from between her dark eyes. Born into a family of Cornish Methodists, she was brought up to believe that Sunday should be a day of rest, that gambling was sinful and that the theater was decadent and best avoided. She had been named after the nurse Florence Nightingale, whom her father Richard met during the Crimean War, where he served as a young soldier before becoming a seaman. He was often away for months at a time, leaving behind his wife and six children, of whom Flo was second eldest. Flo Holton and Charles Dirac were an odd couple. She was twelve years younger than him, a daydreamer uninterested in pursuing a career, whereas Charles was strong-minded and industrious, devoted to his job. The couple had been raised in different, scarcely compatible religions. She was from a family of devout Methodists and so had been raised to frown on alcohol, 
whereas Charles had been brought up in a Roman Catholic home and liked a glass of wine with his meals. Catholicism had been the cause of riots in Bristol and other English cities, so Charles may at first have kept his religious belief to himself. If he did disclose them, his relationship with the young Flo would have raised eyebrows in her circle. Despite the possible sectarian tensions, by August 1897 Charles and Flo were engaged, though Flo was feeling sore, Charles had chosen to break the spell of their relationships to visit his mother while a dressmaker in Geneva, leaving his fiancée to sulk in Bristoli in Cessant train. His father had died the year before. He had been a highly strung junior school teacher and later a station master at Monday Station in southwest Switzerland but was dismissed for repeatedly being drunk on duty, leaving him plenty of time to pursue his interest in writing romantic poetry The Swiss stretch of the Rhone Valley had been home to the Dirac family since the 18th century, when according to family lore they moved from the Bordeaux area in western France. The names of many of the towns in this region and its vicinity end in A.C such as Cognac, Cadillac and the little-known village, about 10 kilometers south of the Inglaterra superscript Ami, called Dirac. Charles believed his family had originated there, but there is no evidence for this among the family records, now stored in the town hall of St. Morris, near Mundi, where the colorful Dirac coat of arms featuring a red leopard with a three-leaf clover in its right paw, below three downward-pointing pine cones is one of many painted on the walls. Uneven postal delays caused Charles's letters from Switzerland to arrive out of order, infuriating Flo, who wished that letters went by electricity like tram cars. A century would elapse before long distance lovers benefited from the type of communication she was vaguely envisioning electronic mail. Lonely and disconsolate, she repeatedly read Charles's notes and, when her family was not looking over her shoulder, replied with newsy letters of how they could not resist teasing her about her pining for my own boy. Struggling to put her longing into words, she sent him a poem full of ardor, in return, he sent a posy of alpine flowers which she hung round his photograph. Almost two years later, Flo and Charles were married according to the rites and ceremonies of the Wesleyan Methodists in Portland Street Chapel, one of the oldest and grandest of Bristol Methodist churches. The couple moved into Charles' residence in 42 Cotham Road probably in rented rooms a short walk from Flo's family home in Bishopston, in the north of the city. Following custom and practice, Flo stopped doing paid work and stayed at home to do the housework and read about the first skirmishes of Britain's late imperial venture, the Boer War in South Africa. Soon, she had other things on her mind. The Dirac's first son Felix was born on the first Easter Sunday of the new century. Nine months later, the country mourned the passing of an Errol when Queen Victoria, having reigned for an unprecedented 63 years, died in the arms of her grandson, Kaiser Wilhelm II. Soon after a period of national grief, mitigated only by relief at the ending of the war, the family prepared for a new beginning of its own. In July 1902, they moved into a slot in one of the new terraces on Monk Road, to a roomier, two-story home that Charles named after his native town of Mundy. The Dirac's would soon need extra space as Flo was again pregnant, with only a few weeks to go before the birth. On Friday, August 8, 1902, Bristol's eyes were on London, where King Edward VII was to be crowned on the following day. Thousands took the train from Bristol to the capital to see the coronation procession, but the celebrations were a sideshow in the Dirac household. On that Friday morning, Flo gave birth at home to a healthy six-pound boy, Paul Adrian Morris Dirac. He was, as his mother later recalled, a rather small, brown-eyed baby, who slept contentedly for hours in his pram in the patch of the front garden. His mother worried that he ate less food than most children. But the family doctor reassured her that Paul was okay, perfectly proportioned. His parents nicknamed him Tiny. When Felix and Paul were young, they resembled each other, a quiet, round-faced cherub with a thick bonnet of black, curly hair. Flo dressed them stylishly in thick woolen waistcoats topped with stiff, white lace eaten collars that reached out to their shoulders, like the wings of a huge butterfly. From family letters and Flo's later testimony, it appears that the boys were close and liked to be with their father, 
whose top priority was to encourage them to learn. With the virtual absence of visitors and opportunities to mix outside their immediate family, Paul and Felix probably did not appreciate they were being brought up in a singularly unusual environment, a hothouse of private education overseen by a father who would speak to them only in French and a mother who would talk only in English. According to one witness, the young Paul Dirac believed that men and women spoke different languages. But Paul and Felix were let off the leash occasionally. Their mother sometimes took them to the Bristol Downs so that they could play on the vast expanse of grassy parkland stretching from the cliffs of the Avon Gorge to the edges of the city's suburbs. From their favorite spot on the Downs, the Dirac boys had an excellent view of the Clifton Suspension Bridge, one of the most famous creations of Isambard Kingdom Brunel, the charismatic engineer who also left Bristol with its floating harbor and Temple Meads Railway Station, two of the city's finest monuments. In the summer, the family would take a bus trip to the beach at nearby Portish Head, where the boys learned to swim. Like most families of their modest means, the Duracs rarely took vacations, but, in 1905, they went to Geneva to visit Charles's mother, who had an apartment a stone's throw from the lake and ten minutes stroll from the railway station. The brothers spent hours by the lakeside stuck with the philosopher Jean Jacques Rousseau, playing together and watching the artificial geyser shoot its jet of water 90 meters towards the sky, when the 70-year-old Dirac told this story, one of his earliest memories, he liked to point out that his first trip to Switzerland took place at the same time as Einstein was having his most successful spurt of creativity in Bern, only a short train journey from Geneva. That year, Einstein wrote four papers that changed the way people think about space, time, energy light and matter, laying the foundations of quantum theory and relativity. Twenty-three years later, Dirac would be the first to combine the theories successfully. Page 11